Good evening, and welcome to the Comedy Club. Put your hands together for your headliner this evening, comedian Carl Ray. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you for coming out. This is the Comedy Club. It's where I made my living for many years. It's also a house of therapy. It's a place where the comic comes on stage to get his therapy from the audience who laugh at his jokes. But it's also a therapy session for the audience who come so the comedian can make them forget about their lives for just a short moment. How did I get into comedy? Well, I will tell you. In the early 70s, I was carpooling with a friend named Desi Miles. Desi listened to Freeway Funnies every morning on radio station KEST out of San Francisco. One morning, they ran an ad for a comedy class. <laughs> I decided I would take the class. The class was held in San Francisco at the Intersection Theater on Wednesday night and taught by a little guy by the name of Frank Gitter. There were comedy shows every Saturday night. Ah, but before a comic could perform at the Intersection Theater, he had to showcase at the Spaghetti Factory in North Beach. And when Frank felt that a comic was ready, he would promote him to the Intersection Theater. You know, God always picked the toughest place he can find for comics to begin their careers. It's like he want to give you a test to see if you really want to be a stand-up. Spaghetti Factory was nothing but a hangout for alcoholics and drug addicts. A many want to be comic who walked up on that stage, <laughs> threw up their hands, <laughs> and say, God, I made a mistake. <laughs> I'm going to stick with the day job. <laughs> but for those of us who love the pain of rejection, we kept coming back until we heard the sound of laughter. First night was frightening. As soon as the MC walked up on stage, the audience began to boo. Get off stage. You ain't funny. They had three hecklers that sit directly in front of the stage. I called them the affirmative action hecklers. There was a black guy, a white guy, and a Chicano. Now, comics were supposed to do a five-minute routine. It took them about three minutes to run the comic off stage, and they got all of the applause. Well, by being the seventh comic to go on stage, I had time to come with a plan to deal with them Terminators. <laughs> when I got on stage, I played at their table. I didn't look at anybody else in the audience. And because I gave them all the attention, they made the audience applaud for me. Got up on stage, held my hand up, and said, I was the best. <laughs> ah, the word got back to Frank, and I was on my way to the intersection theater. I consumed myself in comedy. I would drive 50 miles to San Francisco four or five nights a week, get home at 2 a.m. and be at work every morning at 7.30. See, comedy allowed me to be around a group of people that I had something in common with. We all had a need to make people laugh. You know, I found out later we all had a dark side to our funny personalities. We had fears and insecurities that we camouflaged through comedy. Why, even Frank was all messed up. Old Frank used to stand around and talk about how to make it big in Hollywood. And I'm going to make stars out of all of y'all. <laughs> we were just laughing till Frank to smoke another joint and pop some more pills. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you know, Frank had the last laugh. Within three years. Frank had put San Francisco on the comedy map. Guys from his class were beginning to make their mark in Hollywood. Lou Feld and Bill Forley was writing for TV sitcoms. Jim Giovanni, Bill Rafferty had parts on weekly shows. And Jim Samuels and Marty Korn had the hottest young comedy team since Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Ah, but Frank's top student was a fast-talking little kid that wore baggy pants and suspenders. He would become the star of the Mark and Mindy show, Robin Williams. When Robin moved to Hollywood, we followed. In the early 80s, I was driving taxi in Los Angeles, California. After working 13 years as an engineer in the aerospace industry, I'd been overcome by the comedy bug. And like thousands of other wannabe entertainers, I packed my bags and I headed to Hollywood. 
I'd worked as an engineer in aerospace in for like 13 years. But I gave it all up for comedy. When I arrived in Hollywood, I was starting over from square one. The number one goal of a starving entertainer is to find a part-time job to make enough money to eat and pay the rent. A couple of comics turned me on to drive a taxi. The hours was OK. The money was good. But if you knew how to talk to the customers, tips were great. I started driving for celebrity cabs in Hollywood. Driving taxi would become the most exciting thing I have ever done in my life. If you like meeting people, driving taxi is the way to go. You will meet every type of individual God ever put on this earth. <laughs> and you will meet a few in Hollywood that God didn't put no place else on the planet. <laughs> I love starting my shift like 5 o'clock in the morning. I would head for Sunset Boulevard where all the night folks was getting off work. The hookers, the pimps, the drug pushers, and the addicts. <laughs> Once I got over the fear of street people getting into my cab before daybreak, driving taxi was cool. I was born in Buttle, Alabama, Choctaw County, August 30th, 1944. I was born too much premature. Now I understand my chances of living was slim to none. And the only person that expected me to live was my mama. Why well, they tell me my granddad lived 100 yards up the road, took one look at me and said, I wouldn't live a month. Hey, he didn't come back till the money passed. But I kicked dirt in his face. <laughs> First year was kind of touch and go. And you know, make matters worse, when I was 11 months old, my brothers and sisters dropped me and broke my collarbone. Psst. But I was shook. I just kept on kicking. I was four years old. I woke up one morning. I was paralyzed. Had polio. It's downhill again. But you know, somebody once said, within any situation, there is some good. And I found the good in having polio. Because when I started the school, the kids used to love to pinch me because I didn't have any feelings in the right side of my body. One day, I didn't feel like being pinched. Eddie Rogers offered me a nickel for a pinch. Ha <laughs> ha, before I knew it, I was charging kids to pinch me. <laughs> Had opened my first business. I would come home every day from school, had pinch marks all over my arm. And my mama told me, now, baby, you just got to stop these kids from pinching you. I'm thinking, hey, I don't feel it. <laughs> and I'm getting paid. Uh, what's the big deal? I remember when I started getting feeling back into my arm. I was hurt because I knew I was going to have to close my business. <laughs> so after the kids couldn't pinch me no more, they became cruel. They used to tease me a lot. Call me that afflicted boy. Oh, they were running around the schoolyard all day, had that little afflicted boy walk imitate me, you know. <laughs> oh, they would be getting down. They were so cool, I'd be cracking up because they could do it better than I could, you know. <laughs> but this one boy, Bubba, Bubba Ford, hated me. This kid would beat me up every chance he got. So one day, all the kids were just gathering around to watch Bubba beat me up. And out of the clear blue sky, I just started acting silly imitating how Bubba was going to beat me up. I would hit myself in the face, fall down, got up, got me a little chant going like, Bubba going to beat me up, Bubba going to beat me up, going to hit me in the face, going to knock me down, Bubba going to beat me up. I'm a dead teacher, I'm a dead teacher, Bubba going to beat me up, Bubba going to beat me up. Don't hit me no more, Bubba, don't hit me no more, Bubba, Bubba going to beat me up. <laughs> the kids were laughing so hard, Bubba couldn't hit me. Bubba looked at me and said I was crazy and walked away. <laughs> I had just discovered something. If I make the kids laugh, I didn't have to take them whooping. I became an instant celebrity. I kept kids laughing all the way through high school. I was the man. So 
September 6, 1962 was a special day in the Ray household. It was my sister's birthday. Ah, but it wasn't a big deal. I was packing my bags, getting ready to go to college. See, I'm the youngest of five children. My brothers and sisters had been accepted to Alabama State College, and they became school teachers. But I had been accepted to Tuskegee Institute School of Engineering. I visited the campus when I was in the ninth grade. Wow, it was beautiful. Manicured lawns, rolling hills and valleys, brick buildings, oak trees, paradise. When I got out of high school, I filled out one application for college, Tuskegee Institute. That afternoon, while I was packing my bags, I found some firecrackers in my footlocker. So when I finished packing my bags, I decided I'd walk a couple of miles away to my grandmother's house and say bye to my cousins before I left for Tuskegee. Little cousin Moses decided to go with me. So as we ran down the road, shot the firecrackers that I found in my footlocker. Short time later, we noticed a pickup truck coming up the road. Oh, we recognized the truck. It belonged to that white guy, Bill Kellogg, who lived near my grandmother. So he drove up, got out of his truck, and began to question us about the gunshot sound. When he asked me questions, I answered by saying yes and no. And he asked me if I knew I was supposed to say yes, sir, and no, sir, to white folks. Well, I said no. And without a warning, he began to beat me up, knock me down, began to kick and stomp me. When he finished beating me, he sit straddled me with his knees, pinning my shoulders to the ground. Reached in his pocket and he pulled out a knife to cut my throat. And as he brought his hand down with the knife in it, I was looking him straight in his eyes. And just before he plunged the knife into my throat, he stopped. It's like God just froze him in midair. Had this look on his face like he was embarrassed. He got up, got in his truck, and drove away. Moses and I ran back home. Went into the house. I got the shotgun, and I told Daddy what had happened. Daddy said, oh, forget it. I said, come on. Let's go down to Aunt Ditt's house and watch the evening news. Good evening, everybody. Coast to coast, Douglas Edwards reporting. America's second man in space is reported in fine shape tonight. Gus Grissom is relaxing now at Grand Bahama Island. His condition excellent despite that unscheduled dunking at the end of his journey this morning. The reason for the dunking is not... Daddy go to Aunt Ditt's house, take a television, sit in the doorway, start watching Douglas Edwards in the CBS Evening News. About 6.10 p.m. I heard the sound of a truck coming up the road. It was Bill Callow. Bill drove up in the yard, got out of his truck, walked over to the porch and told Daddy I was going to have to leave because I didn't know how to talk to white folks. Daddy told him I was going away to college. Bill reached in his pocket, pulled out a gun, struck Daddy across the forehead. I hit Bill across the head with a Clorox ball. The three of us tumbled off the porch. As we held on the bill, he raised his hand with the gun and it, cocked it, reached over, shot Dad in the chest eight times. It happened that quick. But in my mind, it happened in slow motion. I saw everything, every little detail. As we held on the bill, he raised his hand with the gun in it. He took his empty hand and he reached over and he cocked the 45 automatic. Clack, clack! And from this position, he began to fire. And each time he pulled the trigger, a bright flame came out of the gun barrel and it made those popping sounds. Pop, 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 pop. Each time a bullet hit daddy's body would flinch. Dust particles from his clothes began to float up and mix with the smoke from the gun barrel. Daddy begins to fall forward in slow motion. 
Bill, continue the fire. Pop, 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 pop. That had fall to the ground. Take his last breath. Immediately after that, he took his last breath. It was total silence. It's like I was in a vacuum chamber watching a movie with no sound. I could see Bill take his hand and wipe his forehead wide, hit him with the bottle and look at it. Then he turned to walk to his truck. And when he got to his truck, the calm was broken. Oh, hell broke loose. I was yelling and screaming out of control. I did it. Moses was screaming, God, no, why? God, no. <laughs> Mama. Mama was calm. She didn't bat an eye. It's like she and dad had rehearsed this scene a thousand times. First words out of her mouth, you calm down. Don't you do nothing. Your daddy wants you to go to college. Now while mama was calming us down, Bill got in his truck and he drove away. Town is four miles if you take the dirt road to the highway and go into town. Or three miles if you take the trail through the valley. I took the trail through the valley to get the sheriff. I ran. I cried. I screamed, God, no. God, no. <laughs> At one point in the valley, I couldn't run. And it seemed like I just stopped. And my body kept going leaving me behind. <laughs> Short distance by the trail into another dirt road a white family lived. They were outside when I got to their house. They could hear me screaming a mile away. I remember telling them what happened and everything went blank until we got back home. See, Bill had gone to town and told Sheriff he'd killed Daddy. They were there when we got back home. Daddy's body was still laying on the ground. Everybody was trying to calm me down. I was just throwing up. Seemed like my insides were coming up. And I just kept begging Daddy to get up. Get up. I'm going to college. You got to see me go. I began to play this game with myself. But this is a nightmare. This is just a nightmare. Hey, I'm dreaming. When I wake up, everything's going to be cool. This is a nightmare. Yes. And I played that game until the funeral. But when I saw his body in the church, reality set in. And when they took him outside and put him in the ground, I began a nightmare that would last a lifetime. Even to this day, I'm sometime revisited by those nightmares. And I'm still begging Daddy to get up. Get up. I'm going to college. You got to see me go. Now the trial was nothing but a comedy show for the white folks. The reason so many white folks came to the trial, well, this was the first time in Choctaw County that a white had been tried for killing a black. Oh, that was a lot of blacks Bill could have killed, and that wouldn't even been a trial. But Daddy was considered a good colored. Was a church man, sent his kids to college, had his own little farm, did all of the right things. 
Why, in fact, when Dad was a young man, he and his brothers had a gospel quartet. And they used to sing at the white folks' church. So the honorable thing to do, put on a show. Now the circuit solicitor, our district attorney there called today, was Wayman Gilmore. By law, Wayman was required to prosecute Bill. But he didn't want to. He was getting pressure from the white folks not to have a trial. So Wayman came up with a solution to his problem. He invited Mom and I to his office because he had a deal for us. <laughs> he told Mama, said, Now, Dilly, if you let this boy kill Bill, I give up my job as circus solicitor to become his lawyer and won't charge y'all a dime. I'm sure I can get him off on self-defense. <laughs> I guess he thought we was just some stupid color folks, huh? If I had killed Bill, Wayman would have sent me to the electric chair <laughs> or led the lynch mob to string me up. Now, the town, boy, the town was ready for this. Oh, it was like a one-day circus had come to town. Oh, we get to the courtroom, downstairs, all the white people are seated. Black people are sitting up in the balcony. White people just laughing and having fun like they were at a comedy show. Black people were sad like they were at a funeral. Now, the focus of the trial wasn't on Bill killing daddy, but on me saying yes and no to a white man. So all the white folks had come into town to get a good look at the little colored boy that had the gall to say yes and no to a white man. <laughs> I had to be some kind of freak. Now, Bill's defense attorney was Joe Thompson. Joe was a show by himself. All oh, me running, raving, running about the courtroom, rapid fire questions. Joe would just go off. Wayman tried to prepare me for Joe. Don't let him trip you up now, boy. He going to try and get next to you. If there was any thoughts in my mind about me being responsible for my father's death, by the end of the trial, would be no doubt. It would be hammered into my subconscious mind by Joe. And the judge would allow him to do it. So when I took the stand, Wayman asked me a few questions. Then it was showtime with Joe. Oh, Joe ripped into me like a pit bull into a mailman. Boy, who taught you to say yes to old white folk? Did they teach you that down in Louisiana when you visit your sister? Are you look a little nigger, ain't you? You ought to talk to white folks, your daddy still be alive. Your Honor, we ought to take this nigger to the Mississippi line and throw him out of the state of Alabama and don't let him back in until he learn how to talk to white folks. Why, shucks, it's his fault that his daddy got killed. The whole time I'm on the stand, white folks are just laughing, taunting me, just making gestures at me, waving their fists. And old judge who smelled like he had just fallen out of a liquor barrel allowed them to do as they please. They were loving their show. His ran and raving, trying to demean me by calling me every type of nigger he could think about. Hey, you up, little nigger, huh? Smart nigger, ain't you, boy? You just a little smart nigger. That's all you is, boy. <laughs> Joe used the word nigger like that's the first word his mama taught him. Now, Joe had planned to prove to the court that I was that up in a nigger that would talk back to white folks. So he would ask me four or five questions at once and demand that I give him a yes or no answer. Boy! Did you shoot some firecrackers and set fire to the Calais property and hit my client over the head with a Clorox bottle when you and your daddy attacked him? I shot some firecrackers. I, I, I didn't set fire to no property. Just give me a yes or no answer, boy. Did you shoot some firecrackers and set fire to the Calais property and hit my client over the head with a Clorox bottle when you and your daddy attacked him? You asked me four questions. I shot some firecrackers. I ain't set fire to no property. I hit him with a bottle and we didn't attack him. 
Just give me a yes or no answer, boy. Now, we know that you can say yes or no, because you said yes and no to a white man. I ain't never read in no paper where it said, we got to say yes, sir, and no, sir, to white folks. <laughs> Told you he was up in the negro. <laughs> Why, he talking back to a white man in court. <laughs> no more questions, Johanna. Oh, the white folks was loving their circus. Joe Thompson was working his magic on the little color boy. They thought. Why, even Wayman said that I lost control and the jury was going to let Bill go because of it. I didn't lose control. I knew I was yelling and screaming at Joe. And I probably would have hit him if he had gotten closer to the stand. I was not about to play the part of that little humble colored boy. You killed my daddy. Now you're trying to put the blame on me. You can take me outside and string me up, but you're not going to make me bow down. You're not going to get my last ounce of dignity. My courtroom outburst wasn't about no Joe Thompson setting me up. It was my personal fight with all those sick white folks out there that got so much joy out of a little colored man being killed and his son being humiliated. Those same folks probably went to church on Sunday, got down on their knees, and thanked their God that one less colored man walked the face of the earth. So the jury find Bill guilty of first-degree manslaughter. Wow. The jury was a part of history in Choctaw County. The first time that a white had been tried for killing a black, and he was found guilty. <laughs> well, what did it all mean? Bill went back to work at the paper mill the next day. And I began a journey in hell that would last a lifetime. The feelings I had after the trial was... Severe disappointment, anger, hurt. I really believed if somebody killed my father, they would be punished. All I could think about, we really are second-class citizens. Now, I knew we didn't have equal rights to white folks. We couldn't vote. We couldn't use public parks or swimming pools. We couldn't eat at restaurants. We couldn't stay in hotels. Lots of things that we couldn't do. But I couldn't accept the fact that my father's life could be taken in a cold-blooded, premeditated murder. <laughs> and it didn't mean nothing to white folks. And the funny thing about this whole scenario, whether I wanted it or not, I became tied to Bill Callow for the rest of my life. Bill has played a pivotal role in every major decision I have made since that day. Even to this day, I still talk to him. Sometimes I may tease or torment him. Sometimes I just have fun with him. Sometimes I may get angry with him. There's just no getting away from Bill Kellogg. Even though he's dead, he lives in me. <laughs>